Amen. Thank you. Your ages two through five. If you'll follow Miss Logan down to Children's Church and someone else helping her, I think, but follow Miss Logan along the way there. And as they're going, I want you to go to the Old Testament again. We just got out of Jonah. I want you to back up one chat, one book to the book of Obadiah. We're going to go through the book of Obadiah. This is not going to be a long series. It's going to be about two or three messages out of the book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah. Let me say it's good to be back with you. I had a great week. Thank you for praying for us in revival at Greyhawk. We had a good meeting there. I'm thankful for that. Excited to be back with you this morning and uh, to be around the the home family, the home folk. It's good to see you this morning. Obadiah chapter number 1. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves come to you, if plunders came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grapes gather came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasure sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and and understanding of the mount of Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Now, Father, I pray as we open your word today, Lord Jesus, I pray for the unction of your spirit to uh, be in the midst of your people today, that, Lord, you may use me, this broken vessel, to, to deliver the truth of your word, and that you might speak clearly to us today, your people. For we need to hear from you today, Father, we pray in the name above every name. And that is the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Obadiah, he's one of the, what we call in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets. He's he's really one of most of the minor prophets. It's a very short book in one chapter. And it contains only 21 verses. And moreover, we know very little about this book. There's not a whole lot we know about Obadiah. And although the Old Testament mentions at least 12 individuals who, by the name of Obadiah, not one of them is identified as the prophet for this book. So we really don't know a whole lot. Yet this book, yet this book has an amazing message for us and for every other age that comes after us. It is an amazing book to help us see things in our lives and in the nation of lives that we live around. Now I want to call your attention first of all to the pride of Edom. Edom was a prideful place. The pride of Edom. You see the fall of Edom was not to go without an explanation. The prophet Obadiah begins to tell us why. And it is for this that Obadiah is written this short book in the Old Testament of why Edom falls. You see, the fall of Edom was to be God's judgment upon it. Because of its over... Now listen, listen, here's the reason. Because of its overriding and its very offensive sin. Brother Ron, what was their sin? Was their sin uh, lying and cheating and murdering and all? No, no, no. No, their sin, now get this, the, the overriding, the, I mean flying in the face of God, flying in the face of the world around them, the overriding sin that brought Edom down and was destroyed was pride. It was an offensive sin to a holy God. 
And the chief concern is the sin mentioned forcibly in verse 3. Look what he says. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Wow, what a statement. Most people today do not consider pride all that bad. We really don't. Most people even in church, those who love Christ and follow Him, they don't really consider the sin of pride all that bad. Certainly not. Certainly not something which God would bring such swift, judgment upon people would God destroy an entire nation because of their pride yes and that's exactly what he did to this nation and this city according to the Bible pride is the sin of sins Pride is the one that is most damning. Pride is the one that brings us down the most because let me just tell you, the reason why that is is because every other sin that we do and everything we do against God is ultimately the root of it. Listen, the root of it is our pride and arrogance. That's what it is. We're prideful people. We're an arrogant people. And when we sin against a holy God, we're saying, God, we know better than you do. We've got this. We can handle this, God. And so there they are. G. Campbell Morgan. Let me quote what G. Campbell Morgan suggests. He says, one may stand before a congregation and hold these breathless interests by dramatic and awesome stories of lives ruined by drink and lives ruined by carnal sins, but try to expound a text such as this from Obadiah. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, and there is a marked difference in the attention and the response. The reason is the fact that the true nature of pride is so little understood, end quote. You see, we're all too willing to admit that goodness and pride may be companions in the same life. We're, 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 all, we're all of us are easy to admit, say, boy, that's a good guy. That's a good lady. That's a good man. He's got a little bit of pride about him, but, but, but he's a good person. We say things like this. Yeah, they're a good person. They got, they're a little bit arrogant, but they're a good person. What we're saying is they're a good person, but they're full of pride. And somehow or another, we think that goes along okay. We think that's okay. But if somebody were to say to you, you know, Dad gone, that's a good person. He's just a dirty, rotten thief. He's just a scoundrel. He's a good person, but he's a thief. I, all of us would begin to say, whoa, 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 what do you mean he's a thief? What do you mean he's a good? How can you mention good and thief in the same sentence about the same person? What do you mean? A man cannot be both good and a thief. Yet in the sight of God, listen to me, in the sight of God, pride is as fully as bad, if not worse, than stealing. God hates arrogancy. We ought to be a people that are praying every day, God, help me to walk humbly with you. Help me to walk broken in you. We, we need to understand that verse Paul talks about that we are broken vessels that the grace of God may shine through. Listen to me this morning. Listen to me. Too, too often we who know the gospel, we who know deep things of truth can get so arrogant about what we believe and so prideful about what we believe that we're no longer broken vessels in the hands of the potter but we're prideful and arrogant in the hands of ourselves telling everybody else that we know what's right when we don't have a clue what's right Without the Lord Jesus, we ought to be broken people. The sin of pride. You see, I just you just think about it. 
Nothing lies so much at the heart of the problems of the human race. Nothing else lies. Nothing else lies so close to the problem of the human race as the prideful desires to take over God's place. Isn't that the situation? Isn't that how we are? We are prideful people. Listen to him again. Listen to him again in verse 3. The pride of your heart has what? Deceived you. Your pride. See, your heart is already wicked. You can't even know it. That's what the Bible says. But then you add pride in there. You talk about getting all mixed up. I mean, you talk about having every kind of thought go through your mind, every kind of situation. It'll go through your mind because you are a prideful person. He says to them, you live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? That's where they are. They are impregnable in their defenses. Edom goes down because of their pride, but verse 3 tells us that they're going down in their pride because, see, they think that nobody can bring them down. You see, that's the root of pride. Pride is saying that we can go without God. Pride is saying to our lives, Lord, I'm going to call the shots. I don't need your gospel. I don't need your walk with you. I don't need the church. I don't need anything about you. Just me and Jesus have got our own thing going. I want to tell you that's a bunch of baloney. I've been going through a book with my children. And he says there's three types of Christians. Two of them are false. There's one... He's the preacher-made Christian. You know what a preacher-made Christian is? It's somebody who, after 16 verses of just as I am and, and three stories about mama going to heaven and daddy going to hell, finally somebody walks the aisle and gets saved. But there's no conviction of their sin. There's no dealing with pride in their lives. There's no brokenness before a holy God. And they may have some kind of effect. And they're baptized in a church. And years later when they die, when they've not served Jesus, they've not lived for his glory, they didn't love the church, they didn't love the Bible, they didn't love anything about it. People walk through the funeral home and say, Oh yeah, I remember. Or the pastor will get up and he'll say a sweet little sermon. He says, yes, and I remember back when that young man was X amount of years old. He came forward in that revival meeting and he trusted Jesus. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, folks, listen, I believe once saved, always saved. But once you're saved, you're going to be changed. You're not going to be perfect, but you're going to be changed. Because you're, looking at not, you're definitely looking at a man that is not perfect. A man-made Christian. And then there's the self-made Christian. Now you know what a self-made Christian is, don't you? There's somebody, there's somebody, they believe the Bible. They'll believe the Bible to be true. They believe that Jesus died for them. They believe there's a God. But as the words of the old country song that says, me and Jesus, we've got our own thing going. Me and Jesus, we got it all worked out. That's how they are. There are people that says, look, I, listen, you talk to them and they'll say, oh, look, yeah, I, I know, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't need the church. I don't need the fellowship of believers. I don't need that. All I need is a tree somewhere out in the forest and we just sit down and I just look at nature and commune with God. And I want to tell you, a person like that is on their way to hell. You're lost. If you believe that and you believe it's not necessary to have the church and the fellowship of the believers and the communion of the saints, you're lost. You say, boy, you're getting pretty, you're cutting close to the brick. Yes, because I, I, I'm tired of seeing people think they're saved and going to hell. Hello. I want to plead with you. I plead with you to repent of your sin and come to Christ. There's a, there's a preacher-made Christian. There's a man-made. He's self-made. He, he, he believes a lot of good things. And he'll even say he knows Jesus, but he has no care for the church, no care for the Bible. He just, him and Jesus has got it all worked out. That's baloney. And then there's the God-made Christian. 
who is born again, not by his works, not by his flesh, but is born again by the will of God, whom God comes and convicts of sin and draws them to himself and changes their lives. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they love the local church. They love the Bible. They love Christians. They love the communion of the saints. They love the encouragement of the brethren. They want to walk for the glory of God. They are not perfect. They stumble on the road and they fall on the road and they, and they get down and discouraged but they know they have a savior and they have a church family that will encourage them along the way. They've been born from above. They've been convicted of their sin. They are repenting people. They are humble people. And the other two people are full of pride and arrogancy. Are you with me? That's why the root of pride is saying we can go without God. And that's what the first two do. It expresses itself in many ways. We can imagine we can do without God in our family life. I'm dad. I'm mom. I can lead this show. I don't need anything else in our business, in regard to our health. We don't need Christ. We just need, to, we just need to eat right and exercise. That's what my doctor just told me, by the way. Eat right and exercise, and that's good. We ought to eat right and we ought to exercise, and we ought to do those things. But listen, I know folks who eat right and exercise and are dead tomorrow, healthy and strong. You see, you need God in your health. You need God in your business. You need God in your family life. We're have, we've been having this Bible study on, on Sunday nights on how to shepherd a family, shepherd a child's heart. And most of our parents are here, and I'm thankful for it. But some of us just decide we don't need to be a part of that because why? We're arrogant. We're prideful. We, we, we want to do our own things. We, we don't want to hear people say that we're doing something wrong in our family. Matter of fact, we don't want God to say we're doing something wrong. And so we... Struggle along with that. We don't want anybody telling us anything about anything. And apart from the grace of God, we'll tend to derive pleasure from another person's failure. Have you ever seen that? We, we derive pleasure from another person's failure. Brother Greg might be able to help me with this. I can't remember this song, Brother Greg, exactly. But there's a word of it that says, kick them when they up, kick them when they down, kick them when they kick, kick them all around. What is that? People love dirty laundry, dirty laundry. People love dirty laundry, don't they? People absolutely love dirty laundry. Kick them when they're up, kick them when they're down, kick them when they kick and kick them all around. Why? Because it makes us feel good. Makes us look good. It's the arrogancy of pride. That's what it is, brothers and sisters. And I would to God that all of us this morning would humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and see that. And apart from the grace of God, we will tend to derive pleasure from other person's failures because it soothes us. It magnifies us. You see, Edom relished the destruction of Judah. They stood aloft. They could have helped. They could have done something. They wouldn't do anything. They stood aloft. They gloated. They boasted. They looted. The stragglers that came out of Judah, they wouldn't even let them in their city. They wouldn't help them. Personal pride. But I want you to see something else this text tells us. It tells us about national pride. Notice what she says again. In verse 3. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like an eagle, though you rest, no, you nest and is set among the stars. From there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Now listen, due to the way Edom was set up, literally any human army, their geographical situation set it up in such a way that Edom was really almost impregnable. It was almost hard to get the city walls. 
the city, the city and the, and, and, and the country around it, even the places where there were valleys and, and low places lying, the, the, the walls to get in that and the way to get in that, all of that going on, the walls were up, and even if, you wanted, even, even if you wanted to get down in their valleys, you couldn't get down in their valleys because the mountains were solid rock around them. It was Petra. It was Edom. It was, listen, the, 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 they tell us, they tell us that, that, that 12 men, 12 men from the city of Edom could hold off a huge army. They could hold off the attack of an army. 12 men could because the only way to get in the city was a narrow path. And only 12, it only took 12 men to hold them off. Pretty tough defense, isn't it? So Obadiah reports the citizens of Edom in verse 3. And then in verse 4, yet God says to Edom, in verse 4, you'll be brought down. Verse 3 says, oh, you think you're strong. You're hitting the rocks. Nothing's going to touch you. Nothing's going to collapse you. You've got it. But verse 4 says, Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though you nest is set among the stars, from there, listen, from there, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Wow. That's destruction. The destruction to be brought about by the Lord who, who would be total. It would be a total destruction, not merely the kind of destruction that even an enemy might bring, not even that kind of destruction, but he says, look, you think that you're secure, you think that you're safe, you think that everything's all right, that nobody can get to you, but I want you to know I am the sovereign Lord. I will destroy you. And look what he says in verse 5. If thieves came to you, if plunders came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grapes gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? He says, look, even those that come and steal, they'll just get what they need and they'll leave the rest. There'll be something there. Even those that might steal your crops, they're going to leave a little bit behind. But he says, I want you to know when God comes and destroys you, there'll be nothing left behind. Everything will be taken. And it's literally Petra, the city, it was, it was to be left the way we know it is today. This very day it is like that, destroyed. And this is the way all nations, God exalts the nations. Those in power see it as a cause for personal pride, don't they? I mean, God is the one who exalts a nation. God is the one who raises a nation up. And then that nation begins to get prideful. Those in power see it as a cause. They boast that they're better than others. They boast that they can even do without God. And then God does what? God brings a nation down. So is the United States destined for destruction? Well, I, I don't know. I can't say that. I'm not God. I don't know. She may recover from her godly heritage. She may come, she may grab her godly heritage back. She may, she may last until the Lord returns. I don't know. But we should be warned. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We should be warned by God's judgment of Edom. Do we as a nation boast that we're strong? We close our eyes to a $17, $18 trillion debt, but we are the strongest superpower in the world. That we have the largest army, or if not the largest army, the strongest army. We have the most missiles. We have the most effective navy. We have most all the greatest technology. We boast that our technology is superior, that it is far above the rest of the world. Brothers and sisters, if so, I think we need to watch out. Because God says that He can even bring our nation. Notice something else they relied on. Verse 7 says they had strong allies. Look what it says. And all your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no 
understanding. See, Edom, Edom didn't understand the hearts of men and women. They didn't understand the hearts of men and women. And listen, when you are a prideful person, you don't understand the hearts of men and women either. They're trusting in their allies. They didn't foresee that these, that these imagined allies would eventually prove untrue. They didn't see that these allies would eventually betray them. But they would. See, we're in a situation in the United States. Right now, where in recent years it has become favorable to trust not just the power of our military, but to trust thriving relationships with other countries, to build our allies, to build our coalition. I don't want to tell you there's nothing wrong attempting to establish good relationship with our neighbors. No, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's clearly better to have a diplomatic relationship, no matter how strained it is or no matter how hard it is, than none at all. But, we, but listen, we cannot trust in these. That is Obadiah's points. Other nations will deceive you. And the only thing in which a nation is truly secure in is a humble, obedient relationship with God. That's it. President Reagan said it this way. He said, we trust our friends, but we'll verify too. You with me? We trust our friends, but we verify. I forget which one said this. said, walk softly, but carry a big stick. And I want to say to us as brothers and sisters in Christ, we must be seeking Christ. Not depending upon all these other things. Is it wise to have alliances? Yes. But we don't trust alliances. Are we to have an army? Yes. But we are not to trust in the army. We are to trust in God and God, and show it by attempting to establish righteousness and justice in the world we live in. Now look, there's a third thing. They had exceptional wisdom. Look at verse 8. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men of Edom and understanding of, the Mount, uh, of Mount Esau? The Edomites really were noted for their wisdom. For example, if you read, you read the book of Job, you have the man Elphaz. He's from here. He's known, this, this place is known as a great place of wisdom. Edom is also, re, is a phrase, in the phrase, the men of East, whose wisdom is in some texts is linked to that of Egypt as the highest of the ancient world. 1 Kings 4.30 we read, Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the East and greater than the wisdom of Israel. And similarly, Jeremiah 49.7 says, enjoying the words of Obadiah, asked, is there no longer wisdom in Timian? Has counsel perished from prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? And the answer is yes. See, the thought is that we are able. That's what they're thinking. We're, we're, we're wise. We're, we're, we're no dummies. We're wise. We're able. We are adequate for whatever circumstance comes our way. We've got it. But... We are not able. We cannot solve the world's problems. What we need is that personal national humility. What we need is a prayer of, O oh, righteous Father, I cannot cope with the situation, nor can this nation help us. Teach us to repent. Lead us in the way we should go. And that's the key, isn't it? Second Chronicles 7, 14, isn't it? Neither are nor any nation is ever going to be 100% Christian. I want you to know that up front. We're never going to be 100% Christian. None of us in here, this nation is not going to be that way. But God will, listen, God will exalt a nation to the degree that acknowledges its dependence on Him and seeks righteousness. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray... And seek my face and turn from the wicked ways and I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
You know, but I, a nation is found exalting its pride. And God says that nation is going to go down. Second Chronicles 7, 15, 7, 14 are people who are called by God's name are to humble themselves as a result of what God promises. When, God, when we humble ourselves, God promises to forgive our sins and to heal our land. But first of all, what do we what do we got to do? Right here, Community Baptist, listen to me, church family, Ron Shaw, all of us, what do we have to do? Number one, humble ourselves. If pride is the original sin and the source of all other sins as it is, and if humility is the opposite of pride as we know it, then the cure will begin at the very core of the problem when we humble ourselves. We've got to begin with humility, which, begin, which means we must begin with the confession that we are not adequate for the problems that, comfort, uh, that confront us. We can't do it. We can't handle it on our own, and we seek God. Maybe we are too prideful, perhaps, at times, even more so than the unbelieving world. Maybe we're more prideful than even the unbelieving world is. We cannot accept those things we, we cannot accept those who do not know the Lord to humble themselves if we will not do it. We can't help those if we won't humble ourselves. Repentance. Listen, listen, listen to me. Let's not point our fingers at Washington or Frankfurt or, or the local county government or any of that stuff. Listen, listen. We point our fingers at ourselves. Humbleness starts first in the house of God. Humbleness starts first in the house of God. So we're to humble ourselves. And then we're instructed to pray. Now isn't it something? We're instructed to pray. Prayer ought to be like breathing to us. But we're instructed to pray. Because you see, prayer is work. And as a result, we often let this precious privilege slip away from us. To pray, to pray means spending time with God. It means searching our hearts before Him. Humble ourselves. Pray. Charles Spurgeon made it a habit of praying the best he could constantly. There were times of he would be alone with himself praying, but he said, I mainly prayed throughout the day. He would, get, he would read a book, and when he got done reading that book, he'd put it up and pray before he read the next book. <laughs> a constant attitude, a constant communion with God, searching our hearts before him. We're to humble ourselves. We are to pray. We are to seek God's face. It means looking to see the way His face is pointed. It doesn't mean just praying. It means looking at the way to see His face is pointed and, and, and looking at the way in which God's eyes are set. You see, if we're serious about healing, if we're serious about per preservation of the land and about our place as His agents in bringing about the measure of that healing, then we'll be specific then we'll know there's a specific work for us to do. You see, there's still hungry people to feed. There's still cold water to give. There's still strangers to welcome in and house. There's still naked ones that need to be clothed. There's still prisoners to be visited. And last but not least, certainly not least, there is the gospel to be shared. We seek his face. And then we turn from our wicked ways. Now, isn't that interesting? If you and I were talking to, to, if you and I were setting it up, we'd say, turn from your wicked ways, humble yourself, pray and seek my face. But no, that's not how God does it. God says we're better, we better pray, we are humble ourselves, pray, seek my face, and then do what? Turn from your wicked ways. And the reason why it is is if, if it were told to turn from our wicked ways first, undoubtedly the vast majority of us, even God's people, would reply in a genuine surprise. We'd be surprised. We'd say something like this. What wicked ways? I mean, we're not wicked. We're actually pillars of righteousness in our community. What do you mean wicked? 
after having humbled ourselves and having prayed and having sought God's will for our, our lives, then the situation is entirely different, isn't it? Then we begin to really see how wicked we really are and now we're able to measure unrighteousness and the faltering service that we have given and in the light of that, we see sin in our lives and we repent and turn from it. Now, brothers and sisters, that is what exalts a nation. It's not, listen, listen. God's not a Democrat, he's not a Republican, and he's not an Independent. He's the one that sets it all up and he runs it. But I will say this. God expects his people to walk humbly with him. That's what he expects. A nation may be prideful, but the only way the pride of the nation is turned is when God's people are walking in humility. That's when it happens. That's what that's the response to God to those who know God. And as a result, they humble themselves, they pray, they seek their face, seek God's face, and they turn from their wicked ways. And so how many, how many, how many then, Brother Ron, how many responsive and obedient believers must do this? Well, I think there are times when the voice of thousands is required for only one to be heard. At other times, as now, the voice of one can count as a thousand. God told Abraham that he would spare the corrupt cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if only ten righteous people would be found there. Would he not spare our land if even a portion of those many millions who consider themselves Christians would call on him? If we would do that practically, humbly, humbling ourselves, praying, seeking God's will, turning from specific sin, God would doubtless answer from heaven. And such a blessing that we would experience a genuine healing in our land. And unlike Edom, which God promised to bring down, God would exalt our nation as a channel of blessing for other people. But brothers and sisters, it starts with us. And either we're going to walk as a people of pride, thinking that we're secure in all that we know, in all of our knowledge, or we're going to walk humbly with our God. We're going to pray. We're going to seek His face, what He's he's really about here on the earth. And we're going to turn from our wicked ways. And God says, I'll hear from heaven. And I'll heal the land. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your word today. Now, Lord, I I come to you. Lord, I come to you and just tell you that I'm a wicked person. I need you. I repent of my own sin. I pray this congregation that we would be quick to repent of our own sin. and That we would love you and serve you and live for your glory and honor. That, Lord, although we are not perfect people and none of us will be perfect, We plead that we would be quick to repent and to live for you and to serve you and to know the joy of forgiveness in walking in you, Father. I pray for our nation today. I pray for our president. I pray you give him wisdom. I pray that you will lead him to truth for our Congress, for our local officials. But mostly I pray for your church that we would be busy about what you are busy about. And we would forsake our pride and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's sing. On to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence there
Say.